welcome Danny. welcome to the show it's a pleasure having you thanks Abby. great to be on absolutely absolutely it's an honor to have you on the show so for our viewers uh, you've had extensive experience in the field of strength and conditioning slash sports science you've been working for almost uh, 15 years if i'm not wrong 15 16 years yeah, I'd say so. Um, obviously, I started in Australia. I worked with a number of sports. I worked at the Institute, so I was, I was lucky enough to work with Olympic sports as well um, before going into football and uh, obviously being involved in national leagues in Australia and then having the opportunity to come to India and do some pretty special things over there with the national team. Uh, what what about you to India? Uh, in India... Obviously, working with Stephen Constantine, we, did, we, we had a really great four years uh, where we qualified for the Asian Cup and we took the, uh, the FIFA ranking from 175 to 96 through that time as well. So, um, very impressive. Yeah, so how was the transition from Australia to India? When, when did that happen and how did that happen? Uh, that happened back in 2015. Uh, when India, we had to actually qualify to get into the World Cup qualifiers. Um, but we were lucky enough to do that, and that uh, that gave us an opportunity to work with the team for a period of time. Great, great. So you've been in India. So you still started in India back in 2015, and you were here until uh, 2019. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So coming from a background like from uh, Australia, where people generally go out to play and not eat food, or you know. Uh, similar to the cultural practices that's there in India. How did you f find the transition to be uh, culturally as a coach? In, in our perspectives, uh, how, how was the transition like for you? Uh, it was very interesting. I think one of the first things I noticed uh, when I got to India was there was no, no records kept on anything. Um, we didn't have any information. Um, and for me, I think that's very important so you can establish cause and effect, what's working, what's not working. Um, and, and, and put down your performance to what you've actually done. But um, there was nothing kept uh, in terms of injuries, what the training had been, uh, what the players had done previously. It, so it was a, a very clean slate and it was something that we needed to get our head or, heads around quite quickly. Um, I guess the other thing from a player's point of view is uh, this feeling that the players were happy enough to, to get the tracksuit uh, they're happy enough just to represent the Indian national team and there was no pressure on them to perform against other countries. Um, they were happy just to raise their value in the domestic leagues um, by, right. by having the track suit. Right, right. So did, did sports science exist in the national football team uh, prior to your arrival or was it something that you introduced uh, during your contract over here in India? Uh, well, they, they had previously had fitness coaches, Abby, but um, in terms, as I said, there was no information kept, so it's very hard to have a scientific approach without information. Um, and I guess we were the first ones that really kind of drove that process and, and really tried to put some reasoning behind what we do. I can totally imagine uh, your situation where there is no data to deal with, no pre-testing, none whatsoever for you to even get a direction to where to uh, start putting in your efforts. And how, how did it, uh, how, was, how was your response from the coach and the other support staff when you started implementing uh, sports science related uh, testing, statistical measures and how was the response from the entire team? Yeah, really good actually. Our, our coach, uh, Stephen Constantine, worked with six different national teams through his career, so very experienced, um, but definitely keen to try and improve what we did all the time. So if there was a reason to do something, he would embrace it and fully support it. Um, so that was very important. Uh, the medical team, I must say, I'm very thankful to them. They, they embraced everything straight from the outset to the point that um, I guess the, the numbers we were taking and the measures we were taking directed their practice on a daily basis. And, um, and in the end, I couldn't get rid of some of the tests because they found such a good practical use for them um, to govern what they were doing and, and, and direct their workflows as well. 
try and try. So, our mutual friend, Mr. Rohit, wanted uh, me to ask you a question about, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, he suggested, he, he mentioned a league, uh, it starts with W, if I'm not wrong. So, you were working in the capacity of assistance with conditioning coach or sports scientist. And then uh, you won the Asian qualifiers and then you went on to become the champions in that league. Uh, so, he wanted me to ask you about your experience during that period of time. Uh, with the under-19s, um, obviously uh, really great to have a full-time program at that point. Um, I think one of the issues was the accommodation for the players probably wasn't at the level they needed. Um, and it, But it was really good for us to be able to link in what was happening with the senior team with the youth teams as well because it, it creates a, a clear pathway and clear expectations and some consistency across teams that are really helps with the players' development. Right, right. So it, it was a surprise to me as well un, uh, until the point where I started looking into the Indian football national team and the support staff structure. It was quite a surprise because what I obviously assumed was that in India, as you know, everything is about cricket. So I never imagined a possibility of the Indian national team having a well-structured sports science team with a head strength and conditioning coach like you, then an assistant position underneath it and a well-structured managerial uh, positions across the team. So it was quite a surprise to me. So when you moved in from Australia where everything is structured, how was the transition like for you uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the assistant coaches? I'm assuming they, are, they were from India. Am I right? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, one from India. We had one more from England as well. Were they quite open to your interventions that you put in place for the team? Yeah, definitely. I think building relationships with staff is always important. As you know, Abby, um, once they start to see benefit in what you're doing and you can show, show benefits to the program, to the players and, and to the coaches themselves, I think you can definitely have a really great impact. And, and, and once everyone's on your page or you're on their page and it's, it's, it's consistent, um, that's when you start to really, really impact things. Right. So in, in hindsight, what was the first uh, couple of changes that you wanted to implement in the team I once you took over the position? Um, so the first, the first thing we really did implement was um, just collecting daily wellness, um, checking in on with, with the players every day to see how they were. And this was something that they'd never done before. Um, even even to give ratings of perceived exertion on training sessions was completely new to them. Um, but as I said, we, we like to track everything and, and, and know what's working and what's not. Um, so that they, they were the f two first things we brought in and that was closely followed by um, bringing in GPS units. Um, and that was quite early on in our, our stanza as well. Right. And could you uh, also describe, uh, help us understand how Sunil Chetri played a key role in organizing the entire team uh, under one umbrella? Because I was assuming under his leadership, the team was at its best and still is. How, how was the yeah, experience working with Sunil? Yeah, Sunil, fantastic. He's a, he's a really excellent professional. Um, and his approach to what he does on and off the field is, is really first class. And I think just a great example around the younger players and, and, and the other players as well, and the old, other older players as well. I mean, um, he's getting on in age, but he's still very much a leader and, and, and very much shows those professional behaviours. And, and he'll, he'll tell you himself that, that he's become even more and more professional as his career's progressed. Absolutely, absolutely. So th th there is a general perception about uh, the Indian uh, sporting fraternity or any athletes who come from India that they are genetically uh, in a disadvantageous position compared to people from Australia, UK or US. So in your experience, was that the case or uh, how was it? Uh, look, I think one of the things that we found is that we really needed to try and get some better intensity in our training. Um, so that, that was probably our first challenge um, and, and that was something that we, we used the GPS for originally um, that I probably wouldn't use it for in Australia or a place like New Zealand. Uh, generally here it would be more around managing workloads but there it was to really drive intensity to start things. 
um, and re really show them the intensity that they would need to play it at international level. And um, so that was, I guess that was the really big first challenge. But once we saw that, um, I think that's when we started to get some really great results. Um, and then I guess we did some research on our own as well. We went and GPSed a lot of the players playing in the, in the National League, so in the I-League and the ISL. Um, and, and one thing that we did find, Abby, is that the, the running outputs are, are the same at most of those levels. But the thing that is different is the perceived exertion, uh, the heart rate stress, and then that just comes from being surrounded by better players. Um, so my feeling is if, if the Indian players can be surrounded by better players more, um, they'll be able to be able to perform at a higher level and be really internationally competitive. Right. So just to understand uh, things a little more clearly from your end about your uh, statement about GPS, why wouldn't you use it in a team like Australia or New Zealand? Or why wouldn't you prioritize it? Uh, we would still use it, but it would be more around managing workloads uh, as opposed to driving a real cultural shift in intensity, uh, which is, I think, what we really used it initially for in India and, and got some great results from doing that. Um, in these different environments, it, I mean, it depends where you are, but if you need that cultural shift, that's one way to use it. Um, whereas it can also be a way of really just monitoring workloads and, and, and what you're prescribing through training. So, um, yeah, different, different environments call for different uses. Absolutely, absolutely. So in your opinion, from a pure physical performance standpoint, uh, are you of the opinion that the Indian players are not far off from uh, the international uh, other teams who excel in, in the field of football? Yeah, I think, Abby, I think you'll notice um, going to the Asian Cup last year where we, are, we beat Thailand and we're probably only a couple of minutes um, from going into the knockout rounds. I think, I think you'll find we're extremely competitive. Um, and physically, it was it was the pressure we were able to apply to other teams that really caused a lot of a lot of problems. So um, I, I don't see there being any problem. And I I know that even the heat in India, we used to embrace that in our training as well. Um, so we really tried to breed a strong player, uh, which was robust, uh, could be up and down the pitch, and, and really apply pressure to other teams. And I think. Um, when you when you are with a team, you don't you don't always have to play like another country or an, or the big teams. You need to play to your strengths, and, uh, and 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 I think we really exploited a few key strengths to get some great results. Mm. That's great. So, how, how does a typical performance battery uh, testing battery look like uh, in, in in the sport of football? What was it before your arrival, and what what changed after you uh, took over the position of? the strength and conditioning coach of the Indian national team? Uh, Abby, I believe they would have done some yo-yo tests, some, some beat tests, and this beforehand, as I said, there was no information though. Um, for us, um, the, the first day into camp is always an important time. We have, you always, it's always interesting to see how players present from their clubs into the national team camp. Um, and there'll be a lot of players that are trying to stay there. They're, they're trying to... Um, hide injuries uh, and, and reasons that they may not be able to play because they want to increase their value by being there. Yeah. Um, so the first morning would always involve a functional movement screen and, and that was an adapted one that we, we put together for the players uh, where we would video some movements and we, we would observe some, some things that were maybe abnormal or different from their normal movement patterns. Um, we would then use that information to go into all our warm-ups and, and, and work throughout the camp. Um, from that, we would do a five-minute run uh, at training where we would, uh, the GPSs, we would pick up left to right leg symmetry through the accelerometers. So we would pick anything that may be out of whack there. Um, and then, then we would do some max speed work. So we'd do three max speed sprints over 40 metres. Um, and then we would do a yo-yo test as well. So that, that first day into camp, there was a, a strong expectation that the players would be arriving and ready to, to do these tests. And uh, obviously there were some times we couldn't do that when players were coming off games at clubs, but um, we got that as much as we could. And, uh, and 
that started to set a culture of players coming in fit and ready and not using the camps as a as their opportunity to get fit right so uh, reverting back to gps what would you uh, deem to be uh, a red flag if you look at the data that you've collected apart from the other than the workload uh, monitoring aspect what else would you look at uh, that comes back from gps yeah so look, we have a benchmark based off research on what we would expect every pos player positionally uh, to hit in a match um, so then we kind of monitor what that looks like across a week and then and we know if we're performing we're we're preparing for a big competition with multiple games in a week we probably need to prepare our players to be able to handle those workloads right um, outside of that, obviously, we look at, at maximum speeds and, and obviously um, exposing our players to that uh, once to twice weekly, and, and making sure that we we've just um, we've targeted every physical area and there's nothing missing um, from from a coaching perspective and and a, and a player's perspective. Right. So, uh, if you ha if you were to generalize it, what typically would be the uh, high speed distance that uh, a forward or striker would cover at least in india when you compare it to the data that you have available right now working with uh, new zealand football team um i think it comes down to lots of things abby and, and and we've got to remember that output doesn't equal performance um physically and then so it's it's really contextual um and, and depends who you're playing what the game style is um and and just all the elements of the game. Um, I mean, we would we played a couple of games against Macau, and the pitch is so small when they sit back in their eighteen yard box that you're not going to get any high speed running. You're not going to get any sprint running. Um, but then again, you might play a team um, like Oman, where where the game can be quite end to end, and there's a lot of transition, and then there's a lot of counter attacking. So then you're going to have those. So. I think it's it's important to remember the context, um, but as I said, we were really happy with the way that the players improved, um, increased their intensity, and were able to put pressure on the opposition that we played, and and, and that that was a real strength. Absolutely. Uh, so, if you if you had a chance to make a wholesale change, knowing what you what you know right now about the Indian football team, uh, what uh, wholesale change would you like to make in the national football team? in terms of the sports science department? Um, I think uh, very similar to what we're doing here in New Zealand, Abby, actually. Uh, and that's really trying to connect the country a lot better. Um, I think once you connect the country better, you're able to find better players and, and you're able to have um, the clubs and, and the people on the ground in the States actually do a lot of the work for you um, in, in developing players and, and physically preparing them uh, to take the step, the next step to the next level. Um, so I think things like national testing, uh, national S and C networks, um, can be a real key part of the puzzle. Um, but from a player's perspective, I think it's they need more time surrounded by better players, as I discussed earlier. I think more professional environments are definitely helpful. Um, and more monitoring the players in their environments, um, their home environments and club environments and, and benchmarking. So really setting an expectation of where they need to be to be competitive internationally. Absolutely, absolutely. So shifting gears slightly from, the, from this topic. Uh, so when you are in such a position where you are the head of SNC for the national football team, how, 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 what is the scope for uh, CPD? Uh, if, I mean, if not for you, the assistant uh, strength and conditioning coach, where there's scope, uh, where you could find slots, where you could implement some sort of uh, further academic progress or practical experience or any internship opportunities. D did that exist within the team when you were here? I think it was quite a challenge, um, being the fact that camps are based in hotels and stadiums and um, there's a lot of travel involved. Uh, I did have an assistant. Um, for the later part uh, of my time there and um, we brought them in from overseas because of the expertise they had in the areas that we needed covered uh, in terms of recovery and um, extra work around the preparation of multiple groups of players based on playing time and intense tournament schedules so um, 
I mean, there are opportunities, and there are opportunities here as well. Um, but it's it's tough. Like it's it's got to be recognised that the national team is they're playing. You're playing at the highest level, and and it's not really the place to be learning. It's uh, it's a place for expertise, and, and it needs to be valued in that way. Right. So you just mentioned about the density of the camps or uh, the matches. Could you just give us a little uh, sneak peek into how the camp schedule or match schedule was during the season? How packed and how dense was it? Yeah, so the way international uh, football works, Abby, is, is basically FIFA give you 10-day windows. Um, so 10-day windows in, in across the year. Um, and, and you get the players for those 10 days. You might be lucky if you go to a tournament, you get an extended preparation period. Um, but outside of that, it's just the 10 days and you might play two games in those 10 days. So you've really got to hit the ground running um, and, and you've got to be very effective and, and use things that you know that are going to work and going to, to ha definitely have an improvement in that period. You, you have to be really spot on. And I... I think that's something that we, as I said, we collected a lot of information on our training schedules and we, we changed a fair bit um, as we went. Um, so the early morning training session that's quite traditional in Indian clubs, um, we got rid of um, because basically we found that their wellness was lower and, and groin squeeze scores were down. So we're probably not getting the maximum benefit out of an early morning session when we could better allow the players to sleep and that would be better for them in these intense schedules. So as I said, we really used the information that we had to, to kind of govern the way that we could prepare the players. And, and, and I, th I think that's something we did really well as a staff team and, and the players really took on as well because we would be giving them the feedback on why um, things were changing and why things were a certain way and, and we could back that up with numbers and, and graphs and, uh, and get their input as well into what they felt really improved performance for them. So how was your communication loop uh, with the athletes? So let's say you've spotted a couple of red flags in the wellness uh, profile of an athlete. How would the communication loop generally work? Was it through the coach or what, what was it you that who directly communicated with the athlete? Uh, I think it, it generally comes down to who the athlete is. Um, some athletes will get along better with certain members of staff, and, and that could be that could be the massage therapist. It could be it could be the physio, could be the assistant physio, uh, the coach, the assistant coach, could be me. Um, so it comes down to what it is, uh, and and I guess trying to ascertain if there's a reason from our end or if there's a reason from another end and then approaching it uh, through the right avenue. Um, but I, I think, yeah, it's very important we follow all those numbers up and I know, I know we, we, we definitely make sure that all, everyone's aware of everything before we, we, we touch the training pitch. Yeah, so what specific wellness markers were you guys looking into? Uh, so, yeah, we, we always look at sleep, which is uh, very important. and. Uh, we actually, we, we changed the number of the hotels we stayed at based on sleep quality scores. <laughs> um, so it really gave the, the, the players had a feeling that they had an input in what we were doing because of that. Mm -hmm. um, out, outside of sleep, we would look at muscle soreness. Uh, we'd look at their perceived recovery. Uh, we'd look at, at stress. Um, and I, I think they, these were the main ones from the top of my head, but... Um, obviously looking for any differences that the players have. So looking at Z scores and, and whether they're outside their deviation, standard deviations. Um, and also looking at there's just a, a larger or a, or a smaller number and, and, and trying to ascertain where it's from and, and uh, approaching that with the coaches and the players. Great. So to understand the performance battery, testing battery that you just mentioned a couple of minutes back, uh, was it YoYo IR1 or IR2? Yeah, I are one. Uh, I feel like that, that gives us a very good aerobic marker um, for football players. And, and uh, I mean, something that we really tried to stress was the improvement in maximal aerobic speed because we knew that would allow us to press for longer periods and, and create more pressure, which, as I said, was uh, one of our strengths. So uh, quite interestingly, uh, 
in 2018, we actually improved our maximal aerobic speeds by 22% between May and December going to the Asian Cup. So what was our what was our highest score uh, in that yo-yo IR1 in May <laughs> was uh, lower than our average score come December. So, right. yeah, so great improvements, but it's, I mean, that's something we really pushed and um, we knew we could get some great improvements with maximal aerobic speed and that would con contribute to the game plan where we could be most effective in, for us. Absolutely. And uh, which test test uh, was that in place for agility, change of direction? Uh, always an interesting one, Abhi, uh, agility, change of direction. I think, I think when you look at that, it's very hard to get a specific measure that correlates to game outcome. So we didn't actually look at that at all. I, I think we didn't, most of our work was based off a speed profile of, of max speed and max aerobic speed. Um, didn't touch too much on agility. We did quite a lot of agility work in training and, and using the GPS to, to look at that, um, but no no specific testing measure. And I think I think the jury's still out on, on agility testing and whether there is a really good test that will give us a good indication of physical performance in games. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So as a practitioner, if you were to compare uh, the efficiency of your IR1 versus 3050, where would you put more weight on? Uh, the 3015, I, I, love that. I love this test, but it does need a 40 metre area. Um, so it's a little bit limited in that way. And um, I think the yo-yo the can be just as effective if you've got the right formulas to kind of correlate to to running distances and, and times, I think I think it can be just as effective. So at the moment I'm using the yo-yo, I, I do like the 3015, but I, I think the limitation of needing 40 metres, and, uh, and and there is a little bit of a learning effect, I think, on the first two few times you use it as well. I think the yo-yo is a little bit easier for athletes to grasp straight off the bat. So um, that's kind of why I'm kind of sitting in that area at the moment. Makes sense, makes sense. And how about the strength uh, testing profile? How did it look like? Or was there anything uh, as such? Yeah, st strength's always an interesting one in football. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of coaches who've come out and said that it's irrelevant or, uh, or don't see room for strength in their work. Um, in a national team camp, it's obviously very hard to implement things that players aren't doing with clubs. So we worked on doing some good technical things savagely well. Um, so really simple but consistent because we didn't want to create new stimuluses in, a, in an environment where the players already have um, increased volumes and intensities beyond what they normally work at. It's, it's not a time to be bringing in new work. So yeah, it was mostly technical work um, done savagely well that would cross into what we wanted on the pitch. Right. Uh, and was there Olympic lifting involved in their uh, strength training programs? Or was it just at the level of basic uh, technique familiarization? Yeah, look, very technical. Uh, Olympic lifting, yeah, you need a lot of time with players to get there. And I, I don't think a lot of football players actually get to the point of needing that. Um, if there's a lot of other things that we can work on to get improvements before we have to exhaust Olympic, Olympic lifting, I think, in football players currently. Uh, what, what, what exercises would that be, in your, in your uh, opinion? Uh, so we do, we do a lot of work with players around, obviously, lunging, squatting, uh, hip, hip, knee, ankle alignment, um, shapes and patterns that, that cross over into sprinting. Um, and we found we get some positive results through that. Um, and, and that probably just crosses on, onto the on-pitch uh, work a little bit better um, than anything that's too radical um, and, and, uh, or anything that's too gym-based because I think we don't get enough time for that in national team camps. Uh, and, and if it's not done in their home environment, it's very hard to implement in those, in those short periods. Right. 
So you mentioned GPS. Uh, similar to that, uh, what other tools did you have access to? Did you have uh, did you have access to a force plate or a contact mat or anything such similar to that? Uh, we we used an accelerometer unit to um, do some jump tracking uh, through through our final year there, and uh, we came up with some very interesting findings there. Um, I don't. I don't know if anyone would remember, but we played a friendly against Jordan where uh, half our team got stuck in an airport for 48 hours without a hotel or, or the ability to sleep flat. So um, when they arrived 24 hours before the game, their, their jump performance dropped by 14.6%. And uh, that was actually to the point where the coach decided we can't really risk our players uh, in that condition. Um, and, and I think we came under a bit of fire at the time because uh, it was a certain positional group that were all stuck in that airport. So um, playing without strikers obviously didn't get missed by um, by the by the media. But it was definitely our coach felt that we couldn't put our players at risk in that situation where they, they were obviously fatigued and um, and that was picked up. Yeah. Absolutely. Shifting gears a little, how was your experience with All Whites? Uh, yeah, very interesting, Abby, because they don't play a lot of games. Um, so, they, so most of my last year, I, I was involved in the Under-20s World Cup in Poland. So that was a fantastic experience. Um, uh, we were probably one penalty kick away, away from going into the quarterfinals. So that was very disappointing. Um, and then later in the year last year, we won a Pacific Games gold medal. Um, so that would be the equivalent of the SAF Games over there. And uh, we also qualified for the Olympic Games in Tokyo, which uh, should be out now, Abby, but obviously not. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, great, great experiences. Um, really good to to play some really top-notch teams uh and, and working with players coming back from uh, a number of clubs all over the world so um yeah it's been a good challenge um they're, they're more geographically split, spread than the indian team was um but i think we had some outstanding results and, um, and it was really great to just really adopt, uh dive into a new culture and a, and, and really try and get some improvements here and really add value to this program i saw an indian name uh, on the list uh, sarpreet singh is, is he still a yes. part of the team uh correct yeah and he's actually playing at bayern munich as well so he, he was picked up from that under 20s world cup and uh he's, he's over at bayern munich um but yeah he was at wellington phoenix before that and yeah a great player um really effective Right. So, what is the most prominent difference that uh, that comes to your mind when you compare uh, where you are right now uh, with the four years that you've spent in India, in terms of the sports science department, the and overall team culture? Um, I guess. I guess it, it, it's always for me. It's the people you're around. So it's it's the coaching staff. It's the it's the medical staff. Um, it's the players. Uh, and then it's identifying strengths and, and, and what kind of brings the team together. Um, so I think the culture we really instilled in India was one of hard work uh, and that was very much uh, led by the coach and the players really bought into that. So hard work was something that really got us very far. Um, here in New Zealand, it's been very much a part of bringing people together uh, so embracing personal connections, and we, and we spent a lot of time on, on that. So, um, and that's and that's something that's kind of come from that Maori tradition as well, and the and the local background here in New Zealand. So, um, it's different everywhere you go, but it's it's about what makes people tick and what makes people want to perform. So, um, yeah, it, it's been a different, but uh, yeah, good. Wait. So in the previous chat we had, you had mentioned that Indian players should be in a position uh, or should be put in a position where they are playing with much more experienced people and they should be put in more competitive environments. So uh, could you expand uh, upon this a little more? I guess that's the desire to kind of put yourself in, in, in good environments. Um, 
Gilpreet Singh was a good example, uh, the goalkeeper. Uh, still the national team goalkeeper. He, he, he went and played in Norway uh, for a couple of years. Um, much less salary than he, he gets in the Indian Super League, but um, the opportunity for him to go and learn alongside other players in, in different environments, um, and in some cases more professional environments, I think is a great opportunity. Um, the same thing with the clubs in India. I mean, the ISL clubs are starting to bring in some really good specialists. So those those type of environments now are, are really good places um, to develop. Um, but I mean, a couple of years ago, it was the the players that were on the verge of retirement from Europe that were coming in and playing, and they were probably slowing down the, yeah. the league as such. Whereas, I mean, we were really pushing that the Indian players should be really the ones driving it forward and, and really putting the pressure on, on those players to, to play at a high physical level. Right. Did you have an Indian staff while you were here in India, in the strength and conditioning department? Uh, no, we didn't. Um, reasons for that? Well, it was, it, was, it was kind of interesting, I guess, Davy. Like even the under seventeen team, they they bought it. They didn't even have a strength and conditioning coach um, when they hosted the World Cup. So that for me was that that was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of things seem to be left to coaches and programs, and perhaps we should be fighting more for some. Um, I guess a more standard approach and more cohesive approach to developing players and systems and and best practice that uh, that we know improves players and, and and best develops them across a period of time to really meet the goals um, of, of upcoming upcoming tournaments and and uh, opportunities. Right. So while you were here, did you get? Uh chances to interact with the Indian Ascensi community? Uh, so yeah, I, I had the opportunity to go to your, your workplace, Abby, uh, the, the institute down there and um, uh, help run the ASCA course down there. So that was a, a fantastic opportunity. Um, outside of that, I tried to liaise with the guys in hockey um, and, and the guys at all the, all the clubs as well. So um, I think Sharing knowledge is just such a valuable part of what we do, and and if you can take one little thing from anybody, I think it it, it can make your program and your players better. So Absolutely. you'd be silly, you'd be silly not to look for, for what you can find, and and it, and it can sometimes be in other sports. I don't think we should bury our heads in, in the sport we're in or uh, the systems that are there. I look for anything that can improve us and our coaches and our players. I think I was on a, a vacation when you came here to the institute for the ASCA level one course because I remember all the instructors who came uh, for the level one course and when Rohit told me that you've been here on site, uh, I wasn't sure if he's getting facts right. But then when I went back to the admin department and checked, yeah, they confirmed that you were here. When was this? 2019? I would say 2018. Oh, okay. So was it just you or you had a co-presenter with you? Uh, I was with Dan Baker, the, uh, the, the president the of the ASCI. So, yeah, the man was, uh, yeah, 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 it was a good course. Great, great, great. So are you still uh, lecturing for ASCI level one courses back there? In, uh, I mean, not during the COVID-19 uh, time frame. Other than that, are you still doing it? Uh, not at the moment, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm quite focused on uh, trying to uh, put this New Zealand uh, football community together in S&C and, and, and hopefully try and build it up to, to physically benefit our players. Um, it's quite a challenge. I've got a few less people to work with here, Abby, than I did in India to uh, find right. players, yeah? Do you, do you understand Hindi? A little bit. <laughs> What's your most favourite food? I mean, Indian food, of course. Um, oh, look, I don't mind a bit of chicken tikka. Uh, I, I think 
Indian food's really nice. I think one of the, uh, I guess one of, one of the experiences I'll never forget though was um, when the whole team got food poisoning in a in a Delhi hotel and we couldn't we couldn't train for three days. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, it, it's not a good sign when you wake up to call the doctor and he can't get out of bed either. Right, right, right. Of all the cities you've been to, cities or places you've been uh, in India, what's your most favorite place? Uh, I stayed in Goa, so I found Goa was quite nice. Um, I thought I oh, always um, I enjoyed every city for what it had. I think India is such a fantastic place. Um, Kerala really nice. Your hometown as well. Um, and enjoyed going down there a couple of times. Um, Mumbai in its own in its own ways quite majestic. Um, even even Delhi, the capital, but yeah, I think every, every place there is really nice in its own way. Absolutely, absolutely. I, uh, so where I live back in Kerala is very close to where Ashik lives. So, Ashik Urunia. Ah, yes, yeah. Oh, great player, great player, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your take on his level of uh, fitness and performance what was that Abby what is your take on Ashik's uh, fitness and performance yeah look he's really great the his ability to get up and down the pitch I think is um really 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 good and uh, I really contributed to uh, one of our strengths which which was that counter-attacking game uh, and the ability to push up and down the ground quickly. He was really a player that favoured that style. And um, yeah, he, he, he can be dynamic and really um, lead to some pivotal moments in games with, with his output. So um, it was great to work with him and uh, so keen to learn and, and take in everything too. So, and I, and I think that, that that was actually something that was reflected across all the players. They um, through our time, they, they just got so much better at understanding S and C and and how to look after their bodies on and off the pitch. So, uh, I think yeah, he is a top example of that actually. Absolutely, absolutely. So, at this stage of your professional life, w what is your focus uh, other than your uh, interest to get the team uh, win and increasing performance of the entire team? For you personally, w w what sort of uh, goals have you uh, set for yourself? Um, I, for me, Abby, I just love being in team environments. Uh, I love making people better. I love getting better myself. Um, so really working with a coach uh, to improve what we deliver as a staff, uh, working with players to Im improve what they deliver. Um, I, I think that for me is, is pivotal. So for me, it's, it just continues to be relationship building um, finding new ways to transition knowledge, uh, transition evidence, um, and, and really just build everyone around me and, and myself included um, and, and do what's best in those team environments to, to get performance. So that's really what drives me. Great. So th this might be a tricky one. Uh, you've worked with multiple sports through your, throughout your career. Compare that to someone who's just been with football for about 15 years. Uh, what do you think are the pros and cons of both sides of the spectrum? Having experience with multiple sport versus having uh, such a narrow, for lack of a better word. Well, I think it's a little bit like early specialization for players, isn't it? Um, you kind of go into one sport, you probably miss a lot. Um, whereas being across so many sports, I think there's just, there's so many little things you can add and, and, and even question about certain sports and their culture and, and the way they do things. And um, doing things the way that we've always done them is not really a good reason anymore. I think if there's evidence that we can do things in a better way, we need to do it. And I think there's so much you can take from different sports. So um, 
I'm really proud of having worked across a, a range of sports and I still try to put myself in those environments and discussions where to understand what they are doing and, 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 and what they're doing better. And, um, and, and often it goes both ways. They can take some, some things from football, but football can take a lot from other sports as well. And, and in the end, we're all trying to improve performance and, and, and athletic quality. So um, I think, yeah, I think being broad and, and general can, can, can have so many benefits as well as obviously getting into the, the specifics as well. Right. How do you strike a balance between what you as a strength and conditioning coach wants to implement versus what the coach wants to see or, uh, you know, facilitate to any prior beliefs that the players might have about how their training programs should look like in the field of football? Because things can get slightly hairy sometimes uh, because there are a lot of videos floating around on uh, online mediums where a lot of things have done which are too specific to sport but we know as practitioners that may not be the best intervention to be put in place right now so how do you find a balance in such a scenario yeah i think i think it's finding the important points that resonate with the coaches um and and i think i mean there's a few key ones for me better physical qualities result and better physical capacities will allow the coach to get more out of the players. So that's very important for me. Uh, another thing is we knew, do know that 83% of goals in football have been shown to come after powerful actions. So what we're doing has a, a definite transition to things that affect games. Um, and, and that was some research on the Bundesliga that, that I, I've been presenting a fair bit recently because I, I think that just that sells that these these uh, powerful qualities need to be developed um, and then for me it, it's it's also looking at these intense periods in games and uh, that's something else that I've um, we've dug out from our games last year and, and what does the hardest 30 seconds one minute two three four five minute periods what do they look like in games and do we simulate them in drills or do we simulate them physically? How much of these periods is with the ball, without the ball, uh, with an opponent, without an opponent? Um, so once you start to put it into football context um, and find a common ground that the, the coaches really buy, um, I think that's where, where the impact is to be had. And, and, and I'm getting better at showing that. Um, and I think... This is, this is where football is heading. I mean, you don't have to live, um, live in these intense periods of training. They don't have to be there all the time, but I think you need to have been there. Um, you don't obviously need to be sprinting max speed every day, but we do know that exposure does condition the hamstrings, prevents injuries, and, and it's evident in key moments. And we've, and we've got videos that show that of our players, and, and that helps the players understand as well. And, so I think it's, it's linking everything back into to what they understand and perceive as benefits. Right. That's a great answer, Danny. Uh, is there some sort of disturbance in the audio video? Is it audible? Yeah, it's okay. Yep. Yeah. If not uh, this profession, uh, where else would you find yourself fitting into? If let's say hypothetically you're not uh, you don't have the permission to practice as a sports scientist or a strength and conditioning coach what else would you be doing uh, great great question abby um i'd be looking i'd be looking to get my permission back to do it i think personally <laughs> I, I love it so much <laughs> um I, I guess the thing for me would be to look into other sports and other aspects of performance. Um, I actually have a, a bit of a love of horse racing, so if I get sick of yeah. people one day, I might go work. I might go work with horses. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. So, on a lighter note, if there was a hypothetical to-do list for you, where there are four to five things uh, that you should get done in a day. How would that look like? What would that to-do list comprise of? Uh, okay, I have to do some training myself, Abby. I believe that's part of my role. Um, 
uh, even even training this year, I've developed a greater understanding of a lot of things um, that I probably wish I knew when I was a lot younger and uh, connected a lot of dots between the theory and what I've been practically doing so that I think will help a lot of the, the players I work with and, and the coaches. Um, so I think that's very important to train myself. Um, absolutely need to do something positive for, for the players and the coaches that I work with um, and, and whether that's pointing out some research, uh, whether it's just connecting. Um, I think that's very important. Um, apart from that, it's just I need to be healthy. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, our bodies are the most important. Our bodies are the most important thing we have. I definitely can't continue as an SNC coach if we're not healthy. Um, yeah, and just keep developing, keep improving, I guess, is, is, the, is the last one. Uh, and continually look for ways to develop and improve. They're, they're obviously key things that I need to do every day. Great, great. So, as a concluding question, what would be what would be your advice to young aspiring strength and conditioning coaches from India, knowing what you know about India and the Indian SNC community? What would your advices be? I think you need to be very hands on. Um, get in and uh, work with the team. Uh, it's very important that you you're there. You're developing your systems. You're developing relationships with coaches. Um, and then as you're, as you're doing this, seek feedback. Um, get feedback on what you're putting together, the style of, of coaching that you, that you give. Um, you have to be very authentic, be yourself um, when you are implementing what you do, but get feedback and, and keep improving. Um, opportunities will come, but you need to seek them. Um, you need to put yourself in position to get those opportunities. And as I said, if you've, if you've got a good system and a good knowledge and understanding, um, I think you'll go, you, you'll do well at what, what you want to do. Great, great. So this chat was more uh, of a generic chat, uh, diving deep into your experience in India, your experience as a strength and conditioning coach slash sports scientist in India. Maybe in the future, I'm sure you have a lot of data that you collected uh, during your period here in India, maybe we will narrow the chat down into something that you that specifically will be of interest to the viewers. It's been an honor to have you on the show, Danny. I hope you enjoyed the chat and looking forward to meeting you whenever I fly into New Zealand or Australia next time. Most probably for the ASCA conference if the travel restrictions are lifted. I'm really hoping so, Abby. That would be great. Definitely. We'll catch up soon, mate. Thank you so much for making the time for this. Thank you.